Dear members, good afternoon and welcome to this Oxford Union event with Matthew Elliott. Thank you so much for joining us today, albeit virtually. My name is Aurora Guarini, the Director of Press and Public Relations at the Oxford Union and your lucky host for today. Before we begin, I just want to quickly remind everyone how our online events work. For those who haven't yet been to our online events before, you can submit your questions anytime during the event in the Q&A function. Please also indicate your name and college when doing so. I'd also like to quickly mention our events for the coming week. Tonight at 8 p.m., we'll be hosting Baroness Evans, the leader of the House of Lords and Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal. Tomorrow, we will be hosting former United States Senator for Alabama, Doug Jones at 8 p.m. On Wednesday, we are lucky to have two fantastic guest speakers, Line of Duty star Adrian Dunbar at 5 p.m. and the Democratic presidential candidate, Congressman Vito O'Rourke at 8 p.m. On Thursday, we'll be hosting the Ukraine Central Bank Governor at 5 p.m. And afterwards, you will have our final debate of the term at 7 p.m., where we will be validly debating the motion, this house would be a roundhead, not a cavalier. On Friday, we have our final speaker event of the term with financier William Browder at 5 p.m. I look forward to seeing you all at these fantastic events. Now to introduce our fantastic guest speaker for today, Matthew Elliott. Matthew Elliott is a prominent political lobbyist and campaigner, best known for being the chief executive of the Vote Leave campaign. In 2004, Elliott co-founded the lobby group Taxpayers Alliance and served as its chief executive until 2004. In 2009, he helped establish Big Brother Watch, a think tank and pressure group opposed to the prevailing climate of authoritarian and intrusive polities being pursued by the British state. Elliot served as the campaign director for the No to AV in the 2012 AV referendum before becoming chief executive of Vote Leave. He's credited as being one of the key masterminds behind this victorious campaign. Mr. Elliot, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's so fantastic to host you. And so let's start with the a uh, personal question. You were born and brought up in Leeds. Mm. And we are very familiar with Yorkshire and the Red Wall. Were you then surprised that this area voted so strongly for Brexit in 2016 and then for Boris Johnson in 2019? I wasn't surprised. And um, of course, as a campaigner, you shouldn't go on um, hunches and personal prejudices. Uh, so, of course, we did lots of polling and market research. So I saw from that where different parts of the country were going. But also sort of drawing on my sort of personal life. Um, I can actually remember I was a chorister when I was young and um, in the early 1990s when Britain was thinking about signing up to the uh, Maastricht Treaty, I remember debates in church and at our sort of choir meetings and choir practices about this Maastricht Treaty and what it was all about and uh, the adults talking about it and this is a key moment where Britain went from being part of more of an economic club, if you like, to being part of a political club with the EU. And there's lots of upset about it, and people didn't like the idea of joining that economic, that, that political union, if you like, with Maastricht. So I can tell from that, from a very early age, that there was that distrust of the EU. So that came through in the referendum. But I think it's also worth breaking down as well um, the, the differences between the towns and the cities. So, of course, Leeds as a more of a sort of metropolitan hub and lots of professional services and students. It was more in the Remain column when it came to the referendum. But if you look at some of the towns around Leeds, if you look at places like um, Wakefield, you know, a heavily Brexit town just outside of Leeds. So you have to look at those differences too. So yes, both from polling, but also from my sort of personal experience and family experience, it didn't surprise me that those areas voted Brexit. Fantastic. And then they voted for Boris Johnson so strongly in 2019 and gave the Tory party seats that they'd never had before. Um, and so clearly the vote for Brexit was quite a formative one for British politics. You're absolutely right. And um, of course, uh, yeah, books being written now on whether um, the Brexit vote has, um, and Brexit generally, has completely transformed the political makeup of the UK. And some people say it's actually um, broken the Labour Party. I don't quite believe that. I think they'll be back at some point, but you can see how they're struggling to get traction now with some of their 
core traditional voters from the north of England and the Red Wall. And Keir Starmer has lots of work to do to actually regain their trust. You know, for lots of them, he was the guy who, from the Labour benches, was stopping Brexit going through. So he has to make up their trust. Yes, that is very true. But they are making some headway in that. Um, moving on to, again, a more personal question. So you went to LSE, the London School of Economics, for your undergraduate degree. Did you ever consider applying to Oxford? <laughs> That's a good question. I did, actually. Um, I sort of hinted in my uh, previous question. You know, I was a, when I was growing up, I was a chorister in the choir, and I was also um, a church organist and very passionate to that as you know. Um, so part of me wanted to be like a choral scholar or an organ scholar. Not sure I was good enough, but um, that would have been a dream. But at the same time, um, there was a big attraction to going to London and, you know, the, the big lights and the big city. Um, and also I'm pleased I went there because at the time, the director of the LSE was um, um, an academic called Anthony Giddens. And if uh, I went to university in the sort of late 1990s, 97 to 2000. And that was the time when Tony Blair came to power and his whole sort of theory of the, the third way, you, you know, you, um, being the balance between the, as he would call it, the far right and the far left. Um, the big academic behind that, the big thinker behind that was Anthony Giddens. So it felt like we were at the centre of something quite important with, you know, Bill Clinton coming in and Gerhard, Gerhard Schroeder and um, pollsters like Philip Gould, who I learned a lot from. So it felt like the right place to be at the time. Excellent. I also did my undergrad in London, so I can kind of know that city feeling. Sure. Um, so after um, LSE, you went to work for a member of the European Parliament. Was it this experience that convinced you to become a Brexiteer? Or did this embolden kind of latent um, anti-European views in you? Or did this, or was this kind of the beginning of your Brexiteer life? It's a good question. I was always um, a Eurosceptic, but I wasn't really a Brexiteer until um, 2015, really. But um, definitely in those um, sort of university years in the late 1990s, when the whole debate was going on about, you know, should Britain join the Euro? I was very much on the side that we shouldn't join the Euro. I remember writing an essay when I was in my sixth form at you know, Leeds Grammar School on the case against the Euro. So, you know, my roots in Eurosceptic go, go back a long way. Um, but really what I learned from my time in the European Parliament, this was around the time when uh, there's something called the European Convention on the Future of Europe. And this is headed up by uh, the former French president, uh, Giscard d'Estaing. And this is meant to be sort of changing the architecture of the EU and uh, devolving more powers down to uh, people and down to lower levels. And of course, none of this happened. It was basically another um, centralizing measure and they wanted to have a more centralized European constitution as a result of this. So what I learned from that was when uh, ever there was a talk of there being decentralization within the EU or reform within the EU, it was unlikely to happen. If anything, things are going to become more centralized. But the um, other upside of being involved in Brussels at that time was the fact that um, my paths crossed with um, uh, Gisela Stewart, who of course, I'd worked very closely with on the Vote Leave campaign. She was, of course, um, chairman of the Vote Leave campaign, but as she was also a key member of the, the No to AV referendum campaign as well. So that was an early alliance formed at Brussels. Fantastic. And so after this, you actually went and set up the Taxpayers Alliance at age 24. So what was the motivation behind this massive act in your mid 20s to really put yourself out there as a as a strategist and lobbyist? It's a good question. Um, so that was basically, to give people some context, that was about sort of 2004. Um, and at the time, um, what had happened? So Tony Blair had been um, re-elected as uh, prime minister in 2001. And at that point, the spending taps really turned on. So in the first term of his um, premiership, uh, they basically stuck to the Conservative Party's um, tax and spend plans, Ken Clark's tax and spend plans. In their second term, they started turning the spending taps on and started increasing taxes. And there wasn't really a voice representing taxpayers at the time. And um, the Conservative Party were going through a phase where they were talking about 
uh, matching Labour spending plans and, um, you know, not really, in my view, sort of standing up for the interests of taxpayers. So I was thinking, what can I do on this front? And at university, I'd read about these uh, taxpayer groups in the US, which actually represented, you know, local taxpayers and talked about uh, wasteful spending and made the case for uh, tax cuts. And I thought this is just what the UK needed because I didn't have a proper voice for taxpayers. And um, I felt that it was going to be my mission to set one up in the UK. And it was a big step. Um, as you say, I was 24 and you know, had my job in the European Parliament and all that sort of stuff. Um, so sort of going from having that to taking that sort of move into um, setting up a new group was quite a big step, but one which I think has paid off. And I'm really pleased that the TPA still goes to this day. And the TPA was a former employer of our current president, James Price. And so Very we true. have to thank them for that. Yes. Um, so there are lots of kind of right wing think tanks in the UK, named, for example, the IEA and, and the ASI. Um, how is the Taxpayers Alliance different to these other think tanks? And, and do you think that because you have a very specific aim in mind, you've been more successful? So thinking back to the early 2000s, I think it's fair to say that both the um, IEA and the ASI and many of the other think tanks like the Centre for Policy Studies, you know, really only produce long reports and um, you know, these reports had you know, an impact in terms of shaping policy, but they didn't really drive the media agenda. They weren't really um, uh, a source for campaigning or pressurising government or actively seeking policy change. It's more a case of just throwing the idea out there in a long report and hoping it will get traction. So I think what I did with the Taxpayers Alliance was actually uh, bring um, public policy work and campaigning work you know, into the 21st century and you know, good use of um, social media a bit later on, um, online having a good web presence, um, shorter reports that would get um, some good media traction and get, get the headlines and really sort of drive the media agenda. I think we're more proactive in terms of our um, lobbying of MPs and ministers as well. So I think we revolutionise things like that. I think that, to be fair, you know, these groups have now caught up and you know, I really admire what um, Mark Littlewood does at the IEA and what the ASI do, they're all doing great work now. Um, yes, yeah, so after you said the Taxpayers Alliance, you took a sabbatical from that to run the no campaign in the AV yeah. referendum. What was your motivation behind that? And then secondly, um, do you think that your experience both at the TPA and then running this, um, this, this campaign helped you in leading the referendum campaign for vote leave? Well, in terms of the motivation, I'm a big believer in um, first past the post. I didn't want to see Britain's electoral system changing. And we really have to think of the um, awful um, years between 2017 and 2019, when, of course, all of those meaningful votes and votes in the balance and Brexit not getting through and all those different things, just to see how difficult can, things can be when you don't have a government with a majority in parliament. So I'm a big believer in first past the post. So that was my primary reason for fighting the referendum. I could also see that um, an EU referendum might be in the offing at some point. I wanted to get experience of how to write, run a nationwide referendum campaign and use some of that experience for a future referendum. In terms of um, some specific points, I think two things we did really well with No to AV. One was um, really going on the front foot in terms of using uh, Labour voices and Labour ministers and um, MPs to make the case against electoral reform. And uh, this might have sounded slightly counterintuitive because the Conservatives just won the election with the Lib Dems and formed a coalition government. But we knew that um, Conservative voters would be more likely to vote for No but we needed to win over the Labour voters to actually get a majority because um, Ed Miliband, their leader, was, of course, in favour of electoral reform. So bringing people forward like um, John Prescott and uh, John Reid and David Blunkett and Margaret Beckett, Charlie Faulkner, people like that, um, that formed a good sort of basis for a Labour voice for the No campaign, which, of course, we did in Vote Leave as well with people like Gisela Stewart and Kate Hoey. I'd say the second thing is, Perhaps the most controversial thing about the um, Vote Leave campaign um, was, of course, the message about um, 
you know, we send 350 million pounds a week to the EU, let's spend that money on the NHS on the side of the bus. Um, that was given a dry run really in the no to AV campaign, where we talked about how changing the electoral system would cost about 250 million. We better spend that money on the NHS instead. And uh, we saw how powerful the argument was in that referendum. We turned around opinion from being two to one in favour of electoral reform to being two to one against. So I think those two things were the key factors in terms of winning that referendum. Um, given that you mentioned the infamous bus, I have to ask, yeah. do you regret that? And, and I more ask this because this because the bus was used as a talking point by the other side for years after the vote as a reason to kind of bring forward another vote. Um, do you regret that bus or do you think that, in fact, you were completely um, correct in using that type of tactic in the campaign? I think we were um, uh, completely correct in what we said. You know, the figure was correct on the side of the bus. And I'm really pleased that actually in the five years since the referendum, um, actually spending on the NHS per week has gone up by more than £350 million a week. So I feel that pledge has been made and uh, was honoured by the government afterwards. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, but I also think the other point, key point to make is that uh, when some people talk about how perhaps voters were you know, deceived in 2016 or didn't know what they were voting for or didn't know what Brexit really meant, we should remember that, of course, the vote was reaffirmed. I mean, you could argue on three occasions, in, in, if you include 2017, but you know, definitely in 2019 in the European elections when the Brexit party you know, triumphed in the polls. And of course, in the general election at the end of 2019, when Boris Johnson got his majority of 80, that showed is another, another vindication for uh, Brexit, another uh, 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 element of support for Brexit. So people can't say that votes were misled in any way. Fantastic. Um, so after the No to AV campaign, you then kind of circled back um, and you switched your interest to Britain's relationship with the EU. Why did you do that at that point? Um, or was it because you can kind of feel that the climate was kind of inching towards this meaningful vote on membership? Or did you think that you kind of had to push for it? Um, by the point I got involved, um, uh, the vote was going to happen. So um, David Cameron in uh, 2013, I think it was January, did his Bloomberg speech. And this was a speech where he committed the Conservative Party to holding um, a renegotiation followed by a referendum. And at that point, it was clear a referendum would happen at some point. And I felt that um, the business voices weren't being heard in that debate. When he announced this policy, the um, perhaps the usual suspects in the business world, people like the CBI and the British Chamber of Commerce and some of the um, high-flying captains of industry in the FTSE 100, they came out based strongly against a referendum on our EU membership. Uh, but I knew plenty of uh, very successful entrepreneurs and business people, both from very big companies and smaller ones, who felt very passionately that this was the right thing for the country to do. And they wanted to have that referendum and have that debate and have that chance for the PM to uh, bring powers back to the UK. So I set up Business of Britain to actually represent that body of opinion in the business world. And through that group and building it up, that became the foundations for um, the Vote Leave campaign. So it was good we did that because it meant that when it came to the economic argument during the referendum and people say, well, you know, does business really think that Brexit would be a good idea? We had plenty of business leaders from very big businesses and some smaller ones as well, who were willing to go on the radio, in debates, in village halls across the country, school halls across the country, to make that case for leave. Great. And so the early part of this campaign was kind of dominated by spats between Vote Leave and Leave.eu. Yeah. Why didn't you end up forming one campaign? And do you think that if you had formed one campaign, the result would have been different? Or would that have or would the or would the result just have been kind of better, um, as in a stronger vote to leave? That's a great question. Um, uh, People who are listening who sort of know their political science will have come across um, um, a political scientist called Anthony Downs, who talked about how you win two party races or, or referendums. And of course, the crucial thing is winning over, as he would call it, the median vote. It's about chasing that median vote, that middle voter. Uh, 
And if you look at the, the middle voters in the referendum, um, a lot of them were um, in their hearts quite Eurosceptic and wanted Britain to leave the EU, but they had um, concerns in their heads about what it would mean for the country and the economy. So we had to work out how we could win those people over. And the other key thing about those people was that um, if they were going to vote leave, they didn't want to feel they were voting for um, Nigel Farage and for UKIP. They didn't feel that, they, that he represented their point of view in the world. So it's really important we pitched our campaign right in the middle of politics. And that meant it was important that we had a distance from uh, Nigel Farage and UKIP in order to be able to attract people like mainstream politicians like Boris Johnson and Gisela Stewart and Michael Gove to the campaign. So those middle ground voters could feel they were voting leave by voting for politicians who they could identify with and appeal to them and represented their interests. So it was important we had separate campaigns and I think the final result uh, vindicated it. And I think had the campaign been joined up uh, as one, we wouldn't have won over those big beasts to be part of the campaign for us. Um, and given that you've mentioned Boris Johnson, uh, what was it like working with Boris Johnson and secondly, um, Dominic Cummings, as they've been kind of both sure. been in the media and, and kind of seen as big characters, what was it like working with them on a day-to-day -day basis during this campaign? Huge characters. Um, in terms of Boris, um, Hugely charismatic. You know, I had the privilege of um, you know, touring parts of the country with him on the campaign trail and just seeing the number of people who would um, come up and want a selfie with him or shake his hand or, you know, come on, Boris, or to have a word with him and um, endlessly patient with um, all his admirers and fans. And um, But, you know, massively charismatic and more so than any other politician I've ever come across. So that's a big thing. But also extremely hard working and that perhaps doesn't come across so much in the sort of public, public's mind. I remember um, there were plenty of days when we went on a, a sort of campaign visit. We'd all get up very early in the morning to get like an early morning train, um, perhaps go somewhere in the you know, north of England or somewhere quite far out of London, um, do lots of campaigning. Of course, he'd be doing the hard work. He'd be doing one, doing the speeches and doing the media interviews and speaking to people. He'll get the, tr the train back to London late in the afternoon. And you know, most of us on the campaign staff would be sort of sitting in our seats on the train, sort of quietly dozing away and catching up on some sleep. And he'd be there opening up his laptop and carrying on with his book on Shakespeare. So he was really hard working. So he's got lots of energy, which is great. In terms of Dom, um, um, what can I say? Very focused. So, you know, got the objective in mind, how are we gonna get there, sticking to the plan. What's the data that supports it? You know, very focused on how he goes about, goes about his work, but also um, massively ferocious. And when you have a campaign like we had, where basically you're taking on the force of the establishment, um, not only the government, but also, um, you know, the big banks in the city and the big international organizations and many other countries across the world who are coming out in favor of Remain. Uh, we really were taking on the force of the establishment you need somebody with that sort of fight to them. So uh, he really brought that to the table and was superb. Um, given that Boris was such kind of a big character and that there was lots made it in the media right before he made the choice which um, campaign to side with, did you breathe a sigh of relief when he eventually came out as a Brexiteer or as someone who'd be backing vote leave? Or was it, or was it kind of a, how do I manage this kind of big character? A huge sigh of relief. Um, all the polling basically pointed to the fact that um, he was the one politician or the uh, most significant politician the voters wanted to hear from about what his point of view was. So the fact that he came out for us was a huge boost to the campaign. It gave lots of credibility. It meant that when people voted for leave, they wouldn't be voting for, feel they were voting for Nigel Farage, they were voting for Boris Johnson and his campaigns. So that was really important. So a huge sigh of relief. And um, really by that point, people had somewhat sort of discounted what David Cameron thought about the issue because you know, he promised to go to the EU and renegotiate our membership and get a better deal for the UK. And his famous phrase is always that you know, Britain would be better off 
uh, in a reformed EU. So, of course, when his renegotiation failed to really bring any substance whatsoever, so failed to get that reform, the logical corollary of that is that Britain would be better off leaving an unreformed EU. And in fact, David Cameron said that a few times. But of course, um, he didn't go along with that. So really, he lost a lot of trust at that point. And voters thought, well, come on, you haven't really got any reform. So why are you saying we should stay in? So at that point, Boris became the person people wanted to hear from. So speaking about Boris and um, and David Cameron's kind of failure to get this new deal, was there a point right before the vote where you thought we will definitely win? How confident were you feeling um, just months or weeks prior? Or was there kind of one day that made you think this is going to work? So one of our um, early victories, and this was in the um, uh, September of 2015, was to get the legislation changed for the referendum to make sure there was going to be a purda period um, before the, the referendum day. What this means is when the government goes into purda, like it does for an election campaign, it means the government can't use the sort of machinery of government if you like to campaign. It also means that the broadcasters have to give um, both sides of the debate a fair hearing. And we really felt that when purda kicked in roughly a month before referendum day, that's when we really started making a breakthrough because up until that point, it had been very difficult to actually um, land some of our media hits and some of our big events because, of course, we'd have, you know, Boris doing a great speech somewhere in the country, perhaps, um, you know, at lunchtime one day, and the government would see it coming up on TVs and would make some sort of announcement late afternoon to capture the evening headlines. So when people watching the six o'clock news, for example, they'd see the government announcement rather than Boris doing his speech. When we went into the Perda period, uh, they saw us in equal terms. So basically flip between leading with leave and leaving with remain. And at that point, we really started to make quite a big breakthrough. And um, from about a sort of um, a week out or, or a fortnight out from the referendum, we were um, consistently in the lead. So at that point, I felt pretty confident we were going to win. And um, of course, you can never count on these things because there's always that possibility of a swing back towards the end. But it felt like the momentum was with us. Great. Well, then when the actual vote came in, were you kind of, I mean, when the vote came in, there was lots of shock seen, not just in the UK, but around the world. You were prepared for this because, because you have been polling kind of consistently. Why do you then think that there was such a kind of a media circus uh, with this vote? So that's a great question. Um, looking back, I wish we'd handled the direct aftermath of the referendum a lot better. And um, of course, it was kind of fused by the point that, of course, on the morning of the day after the referendum, um, David Cameron resigned as PM, triggering a Conservative Party leadership election. So, of course, the focus of the media and everybody in Westminster then turned from you know, dealing with the referendum and the aftermath to actually organising for a leadership election and who would become the next Prime Minister of the UK. And that meant that, to a certain extent, that important few days after the referendum, when it would have been great to have um, you know, Boris out on the TV and Gisela Stewart out on the TV, you know, reassuring the world about what Brexit meant. It didn't mean that Britain wanted to you know, pull up the drawbridge and become isolated. Uh, or become more sort of um, nationalistic in some ways, is that Britain being a confident country, wanting to be internationalist, um, globalist, um, that's the wrong term, about an international outlook, uh, you know, trade with people across the world, have, have friendly relations with people across the world, you know, that would be a great message to land that weekend. But of course, we didn't land it, but of course, the leadership election has started. So I, I do look back and think that didn't go as well as it could have, but uh, you're right, people were in shock. And of course, because there was then the double shock of the PM stepping down as well, it meant there were some weeks of confusion before things started to return back to normal. Great. Um, in your opinion, what could the EU have done to change the result? Could they have made further? Um, a, could they have made further a concession to David Cameron back when he tried to reform it, or do you think they could have? not done anything else and that, you know, the vote was set basically at that time. I think there are two things. Um, so 
directly after the 2015 general election, um, in I think it was the July European Council meeting, um, they made the decision not to allow any form of treaty change as part of the renegotiation. Of course, when you said there wouldn't be any treaty change for the renegotiation, that meant that all the aspirations that David Cameron had outlined in his Bloomberg speech of bringing back power to the member states, revitalizing the national parliaments, um, you know, getting rid of unnecessary regulations, you know, all of this series of very good points, none of that could be achieved without treaty change. So really at that point, they, uh, they lost out. But even in the um, direct renegotiation, so in the sort of January and February, when he's doing the final stages of the deal, they really didn't give him anything. So he really came away with you know, nothing. And, you know, and it just meant the coverage on, I remember the coverage on the um, Friday when it was announced in the evening, um, everybody from not just the Telegraph and the Mail and the Sun, but the Guardian, the FT, the BBC, were all saying, what's this? Nothing's changing. And of course, at that point, the whole logic of David Cameron's position went. So he'd gone there saying, we'd be better off in a reformed EU. He'd failed to get that reform. So the logical outcome was that people should vote leave. And at that point, I think lots of leave voters, uh, lots of swing voters rather, thought, well, the PM hasn't got very much, so we'll vote leave. So given that they kind of started with this we can, the, um, the stay in campaign or the remain campaign, what could then they have done maybe to win? Or again, was this lack of any type a concession from the EU always just going to be the kind of the thing that killed the campaign for them? Um, I think they went over the top in terms of their project fear when it comes to the you know, economic consequences of Brexit. And um, they went really over the top on that. And I think they'd learned the wrong lesson in some ways from the um, Scottish referendum in 2014. And they felt in some ways that had been um, a great success for the um, uh, sort of no campaign or the union campaign because they'd won. But in a sense, the um, independence cause had gone from being roughly about sort of 30 percent of the polls to being 45 percent of the polls. So in a sense, I was a losing campaign. They lost ground during the course of the campaign. And they took the lesson from that as being that this project fear works. And of course, when they did the project fear, um, I don't think people took it that seriously. You know, why would the PM have even contemplated um, giving votes to the referendum or allowing them to vote for leave if um, it was going to be the case that growth would collapse, that unemployment would go to 3 million by the end of the year, and all these dire things they brought forward just didn't really sort of ring true with people. So I think the project fear element didn't work very well. I also think that um, to a certain extent they did... Um, pull their punches. I think that David Cameron was convinced that he'd win the EU referendum and he didn't want to um, permanently sort of shatter the Conservative Party. So to a certain extent, he um, didn't do some of the moves he might have done, or the campaign might have done on Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and people like that. Um, they, there's some attack lines, but not the kind of attack they might have done. When you were planning the um, Vote Leave campaign, uh, did you look back at how they had handled the um, the Scottish campaign, uh, given that it was the same type of people who'd done this campaign? Was there a playbook that you kind of looked at and saw all their tactics and, and then were able to then counter that? Or was it kind of done more ab initio or kind of ad hoc? We did. We studied, you know, of course, both the No to AV campaign, but also what happened in uh, Scotland as well. and. One of the other problems they had as a campaign, and this was a problem for the, uh, the no campaign, the Scottish referendum, was the fact that when you have a campaign that's, that is the establishment campaign, um, that does have so many different parties, you know, lots of different political parties involved, um, you know, the business community involved, the trade unions involved, you know, lots of charities involved, it does become quite unwieldy and quite bureaucratic. And I think that the uh, Strong Green campaign did suffer from an element of um, bureaucracy and being unwieldy, whereas Vote Leave, because we were the um, David taking on the Goliath, if you like, we were a lot more nimble in our approach and could be a lot more sharper in our attacks. Fantastic. And so what were the longer term factors behind Leave's success? Obviously, you did a fantastic job with the campaign, but what do you think were the 
factors that, that have been building up for, for, you know, years and years, even decades that, you know, finally led to this being the key um, outcome in this vote. I think there was the, one of the feelings was that um, the EU had been so unresponsive, you know, going back to one of my first answers, um, you know, they'd had things like the European Convention before, had different treaty changes before and said some good words about giving power back to the member states and all this sort of stuff. It never happened. It always been centralising. And of course, people had never been given a vote on any of these treaties. So people felt that the EU was unresponsive. I think people felt that um, uh, the government had been, um, uh, should we say, economical with the truth when it comes to the effects of um, eastward expansion of the EU. You know, um, Tony Blair talked about how you know, a few thousand um, migrants would come from East European countries to the UK. It ended up being you know, many tens of thousands, you know, two and a half million in the course of the Blair Brown year. So people were quite shocked by that, the deceit there, but also there lots of other factors. So it was a general um, anti-establishment feeling that really grew out of two things. First of all, the um, MPs expenses crisis in the um, 2009, 2010. That was a big factor in terms of fueling hostility towards politicians, but also the um, crucial point, the financial crisis. And with the financial crisis, um, what people have seen was the, the banks being bailed out in uh, 2008. And then basically um, eight years without seeing their salaries rise at all, the standard of living, living rise at all. And that created a, a, a certain feeling amongst the population that, you know, where do the interests of politicians lie? Do they lie with the... Um, their international friends in global forums and in international bodies or to lie with us as constituents. And there's a, felt a feeling of detachment almost between the um, voters and uh, their representatives in parliament. So all of these different factors, I think, played into the result. But I think ultimately, the point was about taking back control. It was about sort of taking back control from Brussels to the UK, to MPs and a government which can be held responsible to UK voters. And you know, that was the key point. And as I say before, a key point that was reiterated again, both in the European elections and the general election in 2019. Great. Um, so what have you been up to since the referendum? Um, so I still do some politics. I, I set up um, Brexit Central after the referendum and um, which is a very successful website and daily email and what have you, which went ran until the 31st of January of um, 2019. Um, so I did that. Um, what else did I do? Um, uh, I did a brief stint at the Legatum Institute, uh, a think tank, which uh, I produced lots of reports on different elections that were going on around the world and um, the drivers were quite behind the anti-establishment feeling and the populist feeling, did lots of that. But mainly I've been in the business world. I've been, um, I've got a great portfolio of clients. Uh, my major one is um, Shaw Capital, where I'm the senior political advisor. So I'm more in the business world now, but I still have a keen and huge interest in politics and follow what's going on closely and keep in touch with people. That brings me fantastically on to my next question, which is on current day politics. So All right. you also created a campaign group um, called Big Brother Watch, which was um, mainly about the infringement on civil liberties. Going into the COVID lockdown, do you, um, are you concerned with the perceived infringement on civil liberties? It's a great question. Um, I was hugely concerned when different aspects of the lockdown came in um, without proper parliamentary votes. And sometimes the uh, parliamentary votes there were gave the government these powers, not just for um, a month or two months, but for six months or even a year. And I feel that parliamentary approval for these lockdown measures is really important. And the government now recognises that. And I'm pleased that there are now more votes on these things, which is crucial. Um, but I think the two points. First of all, the government didn't go as far as some other governments around the world did in terms of... Um, for example, some governments you know, trace people's, um, track people's mobile phones, see if they're infringing lockdowns and that sort of thing. You know, the UK government hasn't done that, so that's a win. Mm -hmm. But the proof in the pudding will be um, how easily will the government give up these powers 
after the pandemic, after the lockdown has been lifted. And um, uh, yeah, so it's a huge history of governments um, across the years taking on powers when um, big events happen, be they um, world wars or um, things like the uh, aftermath of the uh, 9-11 terrorist attacks, where they take on these powers for, and the say will be for a short while and then never give them back. So really what I'll be looking out for is what the government does really from, let's say the summer onwards. So when the lockdown measures are sort of relaxed, what it does after that in terms of returning these powers and giving up these powers. Do you think that the action taken by the government will follow them once the pandemic itself, well, once the virus itself has been kept at bay for a while? And do you think this will also follow the Labour Party and, and the other parties? And do you think this will be kind of the next big topic in politics is what happened during the pandemic? I think it will be a big topic. And um, uh, I think there'll be lots of lessons for us to learn in terms of how the um, government responded and how fast it responded or didn't respond in some cases. Um, I think the government has been uh, played a blinder when it comes to the vaccines. It was way ahead of the curve on that. And um, that's really sort of given us a bit of a reprieve in terms of some of the um, hostility beforehand about how it handled things. But I think a lot of lessons to be learned in terms of how the initial response uh, took place. And, you know, funnily enough, you know, Dominic Cummings was ahead of the curve on a lot of these things. And some of the things he's written about in terms of how, you know, the government needs to be more, more nimble and more flexible and more able to uh, respond quickly to um, external events to take it by surprise. So I think a lot of lessons to be learned there. But um, uh, I don't doubt that all the politicians did their very best. You see, look at you know Matt Han- Hancock and Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, just to see how hard they've worked in the past year. And yes, you know certain things haven't gone, gone as well as they might have done, but it's not through um, lack of trying. Great. Before I open up to questions from the audience, um, what is the one thing we are currently not talking about that we ought to be, in your own personal opinion? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, uh, okay, a big one that I'm working on at the moment, um, housing. Um, it may sound slightly boring as an issue, but um, I actually think housing is a really big, big issue. And um, I was very lucky. I was able to get on the housing ladder when I was just after university because I sort of clubbed together with my sister a few years afterwards and bought a house together. And I, I slept in the living room and she took the bedroom and that sort of thing. But we got on the housing ladder at a good point. Um, but I know how difficult now it is now for people in their uh, 20s to own their own home. And I hope the government really focuses on to, in terms of increasing the supply of housing so people could have the same opportunity that um, I enjoyed. Oh, fantastic. As a current student, getting on the housing lab is very, very stressful and very important. So I think this is a very good answer. Um, moving on to a question from the audience. From, I think, Dr. Ruby Ziegler. Um, so I'll read out the question. The government has announced in the budget that long term non resident citizens or expats will be entitled to vote in future elections. This was a Tory manifesto a commitment before the 2015, 26, before the 2015, 2017, and 2019 elections. Um, over 1 million of British citizens living in the EU long term were not let were not allowed to vote in the referendum was their exclusion deliberate and did it in fact and did it in fact affect the results that's a fascinating question i'm sure somebody's done academic research on that um i've actually seen it myself and but i think the um the margin of victory for leave even though it seems quite close you know 52 48 um um, if you actually look at the number of votes, quantity of votes, I don't think it would have been swung had the franchise been different. Um, I think it's right the government's made this change. I also think it'd be very pertinent to uh, when it comes to if there's a Scottish independence referendum. I think that um, people who are born in Scotland, who have now chosen to live in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, they should also be allowed to vote in the Scottish independence referendum too. So the franchise point will be, there and will be very important there as well. Would you ever get involved in any future vote on Scotland and, and the UK? Or, or is that not really in your kind of 
area of politics? I'm um, uh, a proud unionist. I really hope that Scotland stays part of the um, UK and I really passionately believe that. Uh, but I think it's up to um, Scottish people to vote, campaign and um, on this issue. Um, Fantastic. Another um, question from the audience is from Andrew Wood at Somerville. Brexit was seen as a part of the global shift towards populism along with Trump, and it was also suggested that other countries would also leave the EU as a result of Brexit. Do you think that other countries will leave the EU and have Trump's actions or his um, recent loss in the election stop the rise of populism? And, and do you agree that Brexit was seen as a as an act in a populist movement? Okay, this would be quite a long answer. Um, so, so bear with me. Um, I'm not a big believer in the term of populism. I think it's a very helpful term. What I see is what happened in 2016 was really the sort of start of the rise of um, more of an anti-establishment feeling. And um, if you look at where we started the conversation, we talked about the rise of the third way, and that happened right across the world. You had politicians like, say, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, Gerhard Schroeder. You can go through a whole host of countries. They had these leaders from the centre. And these sort of centrist leaders really sort of led their countries from, like I say, the mid-1990s, right through to the uh, financial crisis and beyond. And what voters in many countries felt was that these leaders had lost touch in certain ways. They couldn't really see the difference between politicians. Both sides seemed to be the same. And, th and then you had the financial, financial crisis hitting and people felt that politicians were um, uh, really sort of uh, out of touch with local voters and more in touch with the international elites. And so you started having a backlash against that. So really what links things like uh, what happened in the UK with the EU referendum, what happened in the US with the election of Donald Trump, but also things like the, um, you know, the French presidential election in 2017. That was a really interesting one where um, all the interest is in um, Le Pen. But of course, uh, Mélenchon, who was the um, far left leader, he also did really well. He polled in the 20s as well and he got into the second round of the voting. What you had in Germany, you had the rise of the Greens there and the AFD. So you saw this sort of pop, this anti establishment movement across, uh, you know, rupturing what was the stronghold of these sort of centrists right across the world. I now think it's sort of starting to um, die down a bit. I think people have had their moment in these countries and people are returning to perhaps more mainstream politics again. Uh, but it certainly wasn't just a sort of Anglo, UK, US phenomenon is right across the Western world. Um, fantastic. I have another question from James from St. Peter's College. Were there any moments in the last few years since the vote in 2016 that uh, when you thought that, that the prize could be snatched away as in during the whole, the years from 2016 to 2019, did you worry that in fact, we, we would not fulfill that vote? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's certain points when um, Theresa May was in power. And um, if you remember all of the meaningful votes that went through on her, on her EU deal and how they were rejected, um, I felt at that point you could have a situation where she would um, lose office, um, have to sort of trigger some sort of general election, which you could see a situation where uh, sort of Corbyn and the Lib Dems sort of won and... Um, and then Brexit would have been off the table. So yes, I could definitely see points where it might have um, gone awry. Um, looking back, one of my um, big regrets in the past few years is that, um, I, not only listen to me, but um, I wrote an article saying that people were right, should support the MV3, the Meaningful Vote 3. And looking back, I'm so pleased that the so-called Spartans of the ERG held out there and made sure it was rejected because actually the domino effect that happened from that in terms of it being rejected to Theresa May going out of office, to the leadership election, to Boris getting in, to being taken seriously by the EU in terms of um, you know, making it clear that he was willing to leave without a deal, so they took his negotiation seriously, to making it clear to the other parties that he was willing to you know, bring down Parliament, 
in order to have an election, so thereby forcing an election, they're getting a majority of 80. These are big, bold moves. And if you think we were so close at certain points at the beginning of um, 2019 in terms of you know, losing it all. So I'm really pleased that um, the Spartans sort of held out, held their nerve, voted against MV3. And we have the situation we have now where we've got Brexit done and Boris has a majority. Fantastic. Um, and I think I'll just ask one more question. How do you think Brexit has gone for the country thus far? And did Boris strike a good deal? And what path should a post-Brexit UK chart for itself, obviously within a post-COVID world as well? Sure. Um, I think Boris did do a good deal within the parameters he was set. I think he didn't have a complete, he didn't come to it with a completely blank sheet. He was picking up from where Theresa May lost, left off to a certain extent. So I think had he been approaching it with a blank sheet, I think there would have been more of an emphasis on financial services possibly. And also I'm not sure we'd have the um, current mess we've got with the Northern Ireland protocol and that's still got to play out a little bit. But in terms of the general philosophy about how the country goes forward, I think that um, I'm really pleased that Boris has made it clear that he wants Britain to be um, an international leader. And I'm really proud of the fact that the government is you know, taking the lead on um, in the G7 context and COP26 context in terms of the environmental agenda, taking the world with it on that. Um, I'm really pleased that, for example, giving the uh, BNO visas to uh, residents in Hong Kong, that's a really important thing as well, a really important signal that we're um, an accepting and open country, we want to help countries across the world. So I'm really pleased that he's implemented the Brexit I want to, which is basically the um, international uh, Brexit with Britain as being a strong, soft power. That's what I wanted. I'm pleased to go down that route. Fantastic. And let's leave it off then on a positive. Um, you are hopeful for the future of Britain in, in this post-Brexit world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Elliot. And I'm happy that you came and I hope the members all enjoyed it. A pleasure. Thank you so much.